at one point, I, I didn't catch the lyrics that led to it, but um, Heather, I don't know if it's, is it complimentary or not to say belted out the word home, sing melodically and beautifully, um, but belted out the word home, right? And the word home was, was cascading off of all the walls of this place. Puts me in mind to a favorite uh, book called Cadences of Home. It's interestingly, written by Walter Brueggemann, who we are reading right now in our Wednesday night Bible study. And it's, a, it's about the Old Testament as being filled from beginning to end with the cadences of home. This is a live issue for Scripture, right? Because it starts by being kicked out of home, out of the garden. It is in many ways from cover to cover a book about exile and yearning to be home. What's interesting to me about that, anecdotally, is that in almost every new member class I have run in my life, and I've been running them for 20 years now, I make everyone go around in the class at some point to speak about what got them here. I not just hear Boise, but hear. In the sense of God stirring and God calling, there's a sense to which you were, whether you recognize it or not, called here, right? And, and I'm interested to not in hearing, you know, this isn't about I want you to tell me how good a preacher I am. I know. <laughs> um, but, but why is it if you tried to put a finger on it that brought you or kept you here. What's fascinating to me is that many people can't put a finger on it. Some people can, they're very clear. But a lot can't, and what they almost, and what you may have said had I asked you such a question is, you know what? I came here, and it just felt like home. When uh, Caroline and I were in moving to Florida, um, both jobless, though I was about to start a job, pregnant with our first child, finally, um, we were going to get to buy our first home. And uh, that was right before things went really bonkers. It was 04. And we went in all these homes. And that was when I learned it's amazing what condition people are willing to let people come into their house um, while trying to sell it. And we went into nothing spoke to us. And I mean it to sound that mystical. Nothing spoke to us to us. We, of course, made a fateful error. It was the very end of the day. Caroline actually didn't know she was pregnant yet, um, but was not feeling well. And, uh, and we were about to have to drive back to Atlanta, giving up the idea that we would find home before we hit ground in Jacksonville, Florida. And we made the fateful error of saying, well, this house is slightly out of our price range, but Let's go look at it. We were desperate. And I remember um, walking in the front door, and like I veered this way, kind of like a blue angel, and she veered that way, like the other side of the angel. And I went, whoa. And she said, whoa. And we came back together in the middle, and we said, this is home. And we paid too much for it because <laughs> it was home. And when we um, moved to Idaho, trying uh, to go to Virginia, right, 
it, it was our own exile experience. And uh, we had to sell our Florida house like four times and t- before it made it to contract um, because it was 2012, and that was just the nature of trying to sell a starter home in those days. Um, and so we were living in a rental house, having fun looking at houses we couldn't afford that were going off the market around here, waiting to sell our house on the other side of the country. And when we did, we had a pretty good sense of things. And we went in one home and we did, oh, we should hire the photographer who put the pictures on that made this look big. Because <laughs> it's not. And then we went to one and we were like, oh, oh, if I was a handyman, this would be a great house. But I'm not. And then we walked in. You can see this coming the home we own now, and we said, we're home. Because it was 2012, we did not pay too much for it. But we would have, because something we couldn't quite put a finger on said, this is home. And we all yearn to be in a place that echoes with the melodic and yet belted out cadences of home. As an expressive introvert, there is no better part of my day than seeing you all, no, (laughs) than, than getting home, putting up my feet, and listening to my kids bicker. Um, But you all, we all yearn for that place to call home. And we all yearn to extend that sense of home beyond our own private sanctuaries. Uh, There's an old sociological work that that talks about third place, right? You have a first place, which is your home. You have a second place, which is where you work. And frankly, a lot of times spend more time than you do in all the other places. But you need a a third place. And to borrow the theme song from the old show, Cheers, it's a place where everybody knows your name. It's home when you're not at home, right? And one of the great, deep, abiding challenges of the 21st century is that we didn't know we were doing it, but we gave up having such a third place. We traded it for online places, or mercantile places, or agenda-driven places. It's great to have a great time hanging out on the sideline of your kid's soccer game with the parents that you come to know, but when your kid's no longer playing soccer, I assure you it's strange for you to show up there. Well, this is my home. Not anymore. It was. It isn't anymore. The yearning of the sheepfold in this scripture is the yearning for a place that calls you by name, that lets you in, not because you have children of a certain age or a skill set of a certain use, but simply because this place cultivates cadences of home for anyone who wishes to call it that. And so this text from John speaks deeply to me. 
about home. Now, I'm aware that when we read it, when I was reading it, we can get caught up in a lot of these gatekeeping functions. And I'm sure you heard them in all of the dialectic around thieves and robbers and hired hands and gatekeepers and gates and doors and fences, which means there's a side you want to be on and a side you don't want to be on. There's an important element of this text that is lost when we read what we just read and forgot what we preached about during Lent when we did the story of the man born blind. Do you remember it? Right? I know I'm asking you to remember a month ago, and, and, I, and I don't mean that tongue-in-cheek. I don't remember a month ago. We did this story, right? The man born blind, and the question was, who sinned to make him blind? He, did he sin, or did his parents sin, right? And that started with the disciples. And then, and then the Pharisees jump in on this conversation. And when Jesus challenges their theological gatekeeping about what makes him not at home or not able to come in our gate because somehow he is a sinner, right? What do the Pharisees do to him? Do you remember? After they won't listen to him and they ask his parents, was he really blind once? Do you remember what they do? They cast him out of the synagogue for being healed in a way they can't imagine is true, they cast him out of the synagogue. So why does that matter, Andrew? Because that's chapter 9 of John. And in John's teaching and pedagogical method, Jesus teaches in a series of three. A miracle happens, a dialogue happens, and then a discourse happens. The miracle is something unexpected. The dialogue is all the people usually inclusive of and started by the disciples saying, how did that happen? And then the, the, and then the discourse is usually Jesus' sermon when he goes off on a monologue about the disconnects of this dialogue and about this miracle. Today's reading is the discourse on the man born blind. A man who was born blind and then healed and then cast out of the sheepfold because his story doesn't align to the way the Pharisees have taught stories go. And rather than imagine that they have to change their theological framework, they get rid of the data that doesn't fit the rest of the set. And even the disciples are confused. And to that then Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The point of this discourse is not about the gates and the fences. It's about the shepherd who yearns to call you by name and to bring you into the fold. You are my beloved. I know, Jesus, but I don't really align to you are my beloved. You belong here because the only category you have to qualify for to enter this gate is that God has called you by name. And that's all of us. And we, as the church, are given this charge then by this good shepherd to cultivate this kind of space 
in our lives, our private lives, and our shared lives together. But we don't always do that well, do we? There's a a line in this text where um, it says, I come to give you life and life abundantly. Did you hear that in the reading of the text? One of my favorite commentaries on that was done by a guy named Reggie McNeil who said, who, said, who was in a, in a keynote talking about how, how we change the focus of the church, how we move more exterior outside of the gate um, rather than inside of the gate in our focus. And he says, well, you know, Jesus came to us and said, I've come to bring you church and church abundantly. And then he pauses and says, oh, wait, no, I think I've got that wrong, Right? Which isn't to say there's anything per se wrong with the church, but the church is a type of space we're meant to create, not an end in and of itself. It's a place where everyone will know your name. And so if we're doing it right, we're folding, needing new people into the community constantly. We're saying to Taylor, oh, I've met you before, haven't I? (laughs) I promise next week, not next week, two weeks, I'll know your name. But we're going out and figuring out who do we not know and how do we get to know them and who isn't here that's yearning for this kind of space and how do we bring them into it because everybody needs a place to call home. And every home is enriched by the bodies that are enfolded within it. Very truly, I tell you, I am the good shepherd. Now go and do likewise. This is the word of our Lord.